Good afternoon to you. Mark Sutter with HurricaneTrack.com here. Hurricane Outlook and Discussion Time. The last one of the 2020 hurricane season. We are at the end of the season. It is November 30th, 2020. And in today's last of the Hurricane Outlook videos for the on season, I'm going to take a look back at some of the big pieces of the puzzle that we saw coming ahead of time that really painted the way for what we had. Um, we saw this coming as far back as April. I talked about that several times this season. Just kind of reminding people, look, the science was on our side this time, and we kind of knew that this was coming. Maybe not to the extent with 30 named storms. That's a lot, obviously. It's a record. Uh, but there were some big signs ahead of time, and that's where we're going to start. So let's go back to April. Ben Knoll uh, sent this graphic to me in April, and uh, he talked about it on Twitter. He and I talked about it on Hurricane U, our little uh, web series that we do where we go into different topics more in depth. And this was an April graphic, the background graphic anyway, uh, minus the little dots that you see, the tracks. And the graphic was the ECMWF UK Met Super Blend of the rainfall anomaly that the modeling was indicating for the season. And you notice, probably because of the strong tropical wave train that was active, that the main development region was supposed to have above average precipitation, kind of drier through here. You know, they come off Africa robust, they kind of dry it out, and then they reignited again these tropical waves over in the western part of the basin. That's what the modeling was indicating back in April. The reality of it is the tracks that you see here that Ben has overlaid. Big time concentration over here in the western parts of the basin, the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico. And keep in mind, this only went through September. This particular graphic that came out in April only went through the August and September time frame. October and November were even more busy over here, which are all you know, accounted for on this map. But the modeling generally did a good job at seeing the clusters that we were going to have. Again, the background, these dark green areas, uh, are the precipitation anomalies that were forecast early. And look, there you go, Gulf, Caribbean, off the Mid-Atlantic here. You had Bertha, Arthur, Fay, Isaias, uh, a clustering up here in the North Atlantic. Not really sure unless they were thinking the modeling of recurving like this maybe less of that. It kind of blew this part here, but everything else, wow, that is really, really remarkable that as far back as April, we saw the signs for what we have had. And this is a great map here that kind of shows you everything in perspective. And I'm going to highlight in here, we'll use this yellow color. Uh, this is the area that the um, modeling was showing here as well. And then up here off the uh, Northwest Atlantic, we'll call it. Those are the concentrated areas of higher than normal precipitation that that super blend that Ben shared back in April, and then he did it again in May, and May went through October. Uh, the different modeling comes out for different time spans, but the bottom line, folks, is the guidance. Generally speaking, and he had the CFS with it, the climate forecast system, and other guidance as well. We even saw people, Eric Webb, talking about the standing wave uh, favoring Africa and the Indian Ocean that was going to crank out those tropical waves. The La Nina, we, a lot of us saw that coming fairly soon or early in the, in the year, uh, before the hurricane season ever got started. Um, as I said, Eric, Ben, Tyler, uh, Stanfield, if you follow him, um, and of course, Jack Sillen, Levi Cowan talked about it. I mean, we're figuring it out. We're not going to get it down to where we can know, okay, August 3rd, going to have a hurricane here. No, we're not that far in, into the advancement of the technology in April for the upcoming August just yet. But this is a great tool, and you bet we will revisit that uh, again in April of 2021 uh, when Ben issues it for the 2021 season. We'll take a look then. So Colorado State University... Uh, speaking of forecasts, this is from Dr. Klotzbach, his tweet from today. In April, speaking of April, they were looking at about 16 named storms, which is above average. Eight hurricanes forming, four of them becoming intense. We had about double the named storms, you know, close to it. Um, several more hurricanes, about five more hurricanes than was forecast. Two more in intense hurricanes. But the April outlook, you know... That was pretty good. Seeing the signs for a busy season, that was the bottom line. 
Uh, once they got into June, July, and August, it became clear, you know, just like in a sporting event, you early on, you have prognostications as the game goes on, and you kind of adjust your stats, and you figure out who's going to eventually win the game. In this situation, I think the key takeaway here, what I want you to understand, don't focus on that number 30. Focus on the background state was easily identifiable. And who is ever going to you know, come out and say, in April, we're going to have 24 named storms? It's really hard to do that without the science to back it up. Um, and so, you know, the ideas were there, and I thought the forecast overall uh, did very well at, at looking ahead and seeing the season that we, in fact, had. Looking at it from an ACE perspective, the accumulated cyclone energy, uh, Teddy was the big winner there at 27.8. What is ACE? That is the energy that is expended. It tells you nothing about impact or dollar amount of damage or lives lost or lives destroyed, honestly. Uh, and I mean, look at Laura. The ACE score for Laura was 12.8, almost half of what Teddy's was. But Laura was a 150 mile per hour, devastating, like $40 billion hurricane, something like that. I think I heard that today on NPR. Probably go higher than that when all is said and done. But it had an ACE score much lower than Teddy. Why? Because Teddy was stronger in its lifespan for a longer period of time. Laura was the most intense hurricane to hit the U.S. this year. Teddy didn't hit the U.S. directly. It sent surf and high waves and other impacts to the East Coast. But you got to understand the ACE perspective here. A lot of these high-scoring ACE hurricanes out in the open Atlantic, um, Paulette at 15, Teddy at 27, you know, Paulette you know, went over Bermuda, but Teddy... Um, didn't affect land directly. And so your, your big ace producers uh, just didn't get close to the United States until late in the game is what it comes down to. For example, um, Zeta, 7.5, but a high-impact hurricane, low A score. Why? Because it became intense late in the game. Same thing with Laura. Delta, another example, a little bit higher A score than Laura because it got stronger just a little bit sooner than Laura did uh, after coming off the Yucatan down there back in October. Remember Delta, one of many that we tracked this year. So this is a good way to look at it all. Some of the low, low, low scores. Bertha at 0.4. Uh, Omar also at 0.4. These were short-lived, very weak. There's Josephine in there. And that's what this distributive or distributive graphic sh uh, here shows you is a way to visualize these statistics, distributing the ACE around so you can see it in terms of these pie chart sections uh, pretty remarkable. You can follow Dr. Klotzbach on Twitter. And why wouldn't you, right? And uh, get all that information there. All right. Why did this happen? Why was the season busy like this in the first place? I boil it down to a couple of very simple answers. The blue area that you see, that is the La Nina that came together in the Pacific. The Atlantic had a warmer than overall profile. We saw that coming as well. I talked about that in my weekly discussions in the off-season, and it came to pass, and that is a big driver. When you have a colder Pacific against a warmer-than-average Atlantic, you usually have a very active season. Although, it is hard for me to understand why the season was hyperactive. I mean, there's other things at play. 2010 had a La Nina, generally speaking, and a warmer overall Atlantic signature, especially uh, through the classic areas of what we call the AMO. Uh, but we only had 19 named storms that year. But the ACE in 2010 was much higher. It was well over 200, if I recall. And um, this year, the Atlantic was warmer you know, than, the, than average. Uh, and we had the La Nina, but we had an exceptionally busy year you know, with 30 different named storms out there. And I think another big part of it is the role that Africa played with the standing wave of upward motion, where it just cranked out tropical wave after tropical wave that just came out into the Atlantic. There's usually about 100 per year. Did we have more than that this year? I don't know. I'd have to dig deep and do some research to find out. But the tropical waves were robust, and they were plentiful. They were highly energetic. And there may have been more than average. Maybe that was a big part of it. And we saw that coming as well. I distinctly remember people like Eric Webb 
tweeting about the standing wave and how it was just you couldn't draw a better atmospheric signal for hurricane season early on April and May we saw that coming and that is exactly what happened it was very busy for us as well out on the field starting in May outside the season um, in the middle of May no less tropical storm Arthur uh, then it was not until August that we had our first hurricane mission, and that was Isaias. We actually went down into Florida for that, too. Um, not much impact there. It rounded the corner and came up into my neck of the woods up here. Uh, then we went down into the Gulf Coast, one of many, many trips down here, as you can see. Marco, Laura uh, came back home, then had to turn around, come back for Sally, and then stay down there for Beta. Uh, down on the Texas coast, and then, of course, we had Delta back in Louisiana. Uh, and, oh, lest we forget, Cristobal. Sorry, I forgot about that. See, it's been so busy, I can't even remember what the heck I did. Cristobal was, of course, in early June, um, and I was down there along the Gulf Coast for that in Mississippi. That was actually a pretty high-impact event from Surge along the Mississippi coast. And then we ended the season uh, in Florida, for ADA, which ADA, I believe, is a warning shot of things to come. Uh, it's been a long time since the west coast of Florida has had a significant hurricane impact. Uh, Irma was a close call in 2017, no doubt. But ADA, I think, shows us what's possible. Had, had ADA been a month earlier over warmer sea surface temperatures with the same atmospheric setup, I think it would have easily been a strong hurricane passing by Tampa, and those two to four feet of surge that we saw, those values, would have been maybe double that, if not more. Um, so Ada was a, a kind of a good way for us to end the season, setting up in Tampa, St. Pete, for the first time ever, after going down to the Keys uh, for round one. And yeah, we're out there for 10 times, 25,000 miles, easily driven for all these different storms. We call it the Hurricane Highway. That's why I call it that. The busiest season for landfalls in our history, the, as, uh, as long as I've been doing this, going back to the mid-1990s, this is the busiest year that I have ever had. Now, we're going to move into the off-season. You know, midnight tonight, it becomes December 1st. And in that off-season, we don't just turn everything off and say, see you later, we'll see you on June 1st. Anything but. Uh, the off-season is going to be busy with lots of projects coming up. I'll show you that in a moment. I've got a good graphic to show you. Um, and uh, we have a new logo for it. In fact, what I want to do is literally just kind of transition over and start more of an, an initiative instead of just sort of like, yeah, we do stuff in the off season. I'm going to push it harder than ever before. This idea that if we're ready for hurricanes, we're ready for anything. If you understand hurricanes, you can understand other weather. And I'm a weather geek at heart. You know, always have been. I don't know where that comes from, but I'm a weather geek and I uh, started with hurricanes. That's my specialty, but it is other weather too that piques my interest. And that being said, here is the official Hurricane Track off-season logo. Replace the hurricane with a snowflake, have the wintry kind of look to it, and we will be doing lots of stuff in the off-season. When I say we, you talk about, well, who is this we? Well, that's an interesting question. As of this year, it's by, you know, in terms of the amount of support, it is the most successful year I've ever had. My YouTube channel grew phenomenally. Twitter grew. The Patreon support, crowdfunding. We literally have a small army of volunteers now. The gentleman that made this graphic, a young man named Tim, high school kid, put this graphic together for me. You know, just trying to help out. Wants to be a part of the team, so to speak. Uh, Corey does the thumbnails. I'll go back to that. Over in the UK, she produces these. I've talked about the track map that we have, the really incredible tracking map. That was put together by another one of our supporters, completely volunteered to do it. Will Woodgate, also over from the UK, and a host of other people. Mike Cornelius, um, I mean, CJ and his work, a lot of different people helping out, people in the field. Mike Farrow helped out this year, a good friend of mine, the pandemic causing him to lose his longtime career job in radio. They just started slashing. He said, look, dude, I'm available. He lives right here in Wilmington. So he went with me. We've known each other for 20 years. 
Mike and I worked together, Brent, uh, Greg Nordstrom, and then we worked uh, again with this new gentleman here from Wilmington as well named Charles. Just a lot of awesome people that have made the on-season part of this the most successful from an operational standpoint that I've ever had. And I really, really appreciate that. People chipping in, supporting with not only, you know, uh, the funding through Patreon, but buying equipment, sending that to us to put into the field to use to help the greater good when it's all said and done. This might be my job, but at the end of the day, we want to try to contribute to the science, help spread awareness, and kind of get people excited about the weather. Because if you can get people excited, you can motivate them, and you can teach them something. So this is the new logo for the off-season. And the off-season begins at midnight. And as we look ahead to 2021, this is what I want to do. We will cover, to the best of our ability, thanks to the funding that we've got through Patreon, East Coast winter storms, you know, like those big nor'easters, those bomb cyclones. I've done that going back to 2014, and I will continue to do it if we have any. Um, as long as the frickin' virus situation doesn't screw that up, and it very well could. It may, it may be that we just can't travel much in December, January, February. We've got to face that reality. But we'll deal with that as it comes. But yeah, East Coast winter storms, lake effect snow. I went up there uh, into western New York in February into early March of this year. And oh my gosh, that was remarkable. I am hooked. The lake effect snow machine, I definitely want to document that. Um, I also want to cover a high plains blizzard. And let me tell you about that real quick. One of our supporters and a good friend of ours, his name is Derek Thompson. He lives up in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Later in the month of December, I'm going to ship him three of our unmanned cameras. And he's going to have those ready to go. And he's going to put those out in the Dakotas whenever there's a significant system coming through. And we're going to have some live coverage up there thanks to Derek. This is what I'm talking about. This network of people that are helping out, making everything easier to do than ever before. Uh, but that being said... When we, and those are for the kind of run-of-the-mill, you know, blizzard warning, kind of a local area, not a major big deal event, but enough that Derek will go put these cams up and we can see what happens. Uh, but I want to go up there with Greg Nordstrom, who's a big winter forecast freak. I mean, this guy loves the forecast winter. He loves the winter weather. He loves forecasting it. Uh, Greg and I want to go up there for one of those big bomb cyclones that comes out of the, um, the, the front range of the Rockies into the high plains. You get those 980 millibar lows, you know, those giant comma-shaped storms over the plains. We're going to go out there for one of those, hopefully. Uh, then, hopefully, in 2021, we'll have a couple of conferences. Hopefully, if, again, it's all up to the pandemic and how that pans out. Uh, and then in May, we will resume getting ready in earnest for the 2021 hurricane season with a big, big severe weather push on the Great Plains. I'll talk about that in more detail, but let me give you a hint real quick. We are going to have, we already have them, we're just, we're going to have them even better, 20 live camera systems, two complete weather stations that includes the anemometer part. Every one of the live camera systems in 2021 will now be augmented with a live uh, Kestrel Drop 3 sensor that will send data through a little Raspberry Pi computer inside the box where the camera is housed so that every camera box will now have live weather data and then two of the points that we'll have out there will have wind data as well. It's a lot harder and a lot more expensive to capture wind data but temperature, humidity, dew point, and pressure, that's easy. And all of these Kestrel uh, sensors, we have them, we already have 26 of them People like you funded them. They literally sent them to the project. To me, the project, I mean, that's we're all one and the same. I hope you get that by now. And we're going to put all that into use in a massive effort in May uh, where we go out on the Great Plains for uh, an outbreak of severe weather. And we're going to set up all 20 of these cameras over hundreds of miles, each, each one of them having those sensors in there. Uh, we're going to launch the weather balloon uh, behind a dry line passage. I mean, we're talking about some really neat, groundbreaking stuff in the severe weather realm on the Great Plains in May. 
Uh, probably have six to eight people out there working with us to do it. A couple of our patrons are going to come with us. I mean, I'm talking, wait till we get to that. I mean, between now and then, the other stuff's exciting, yes, but the big severe weather campaign in May, which will be a catalyst to get us ready for the 2021 hurricane season, which, of course, will start shortly thereafter in June. So, uh, yeah, we got a busy time coming up. Uh, in the off-season, I will be doing what we call the off-season edition of the Hurricane Outlook and Discussion. This video will be every week, and I'll start tomorrow just to get things kicked off on December 1st. And one of the things that we will watch, and they'll be fairly short. This is a long one today because we had to kind of, you know, do a wrap-up. But we're going to be watching this. People like Tyler. Who is Tyler? I mentioned Tyler already. Grad student, Virginia Tech. Got a BS already from meteorology. That's pretty accomplished, wouldn't you say? Uh, so we're going to follow people like Tyler. We'll follow Ben and Eric and Jack and others, Levi. And we're going to be watching for that right there. La Nina. Does the La Nina stick around? This right here is the key. The longer that the Pacific stays cold and the Atlantic stays warm, that is the big key, in my opinion, opinion for next year in the Atlantic hurricane season. And so sort of the first teaser the first shot across the bow at what we will be watching for next year, next season, is this tweet right here from Tyler, hi highlights it. Enso update, Enso El Nino Southern Oscillation. The strongest easterly wind burst of this La Nina event thus far has been underway for the last 10 days near the dateline. This will aid in maintaining enhanced equatorial Pacific upwelling and initiate a reinforcing upwelling Kelvin wave to strengthen La Nina through the winter of 2020-2021. You look at that and you go, what in the heck am I looking at? Mr. Mark, please explain it to me. The bottom line, when I look at this and I see here's your longitude areas, this is all just indicative of strong easterly winds across the tropical Pacific. And another way to look at that is on this map, that graphic there tells me that the wind down here across the uh, equatorial Pacific is hauling the mail from the east. That's why it's called easterly. And that's going to continue to push the Pacific westward. It upwells colder water from below across the region. And that's that upwelling Kelvin wave that Tyler talked about. And the La Nina engine continues in earnest for now. How long will that happen? Uh, how long does the Atlantic stay warm like we're seeing now with a fairly warm MDR, very warm Northwest Atlantic, still a warm Gulf compared to average? Those are the things that we will watch for in the off season starting tomorrow and every week from thereafter. Now, a couple things before I sign off. Um, during our winter storm coverage, just like we've done in the hurricane season, we will have a live YouTube feed going. Our goal is to serve the public as best as possible. To fund that goal, I rely on the era of crowdfunding, and we do that through Patreon. Um, it is not too late for you to become a member. Some people are going to cancel because the season's over, kind of that weather tourism thing. I get it. You're just interested in the main stuff. That's fine. Your support matters. If it's just for the during the season part, that's good. It made the season that much more successful. For those of you that are in the position to go the long haul, to be a sustaining member, there are perks for that. One of those is the resumption of the podcast that I do. It's an audio podcast called Stories from the Hurricane Highway. Season 1, which was produced from last December through May, starts at the very beginning of my career with an in-depth look. Those behind-the-scenes details, almost like an audio book, um, and that's all online already through Patreon. Season 2, the first episode, beginning with 2005, it's a retrospective. The whole series is a look back at my career. And it's kind of a um, companion to the Hurricane Highway streaming series that we have produced that goes and looks back at past hurricane seasons. And the one that we have online now on Amazon and YouTube is 2019, of course. The podcast is an in-depth look at the whole caboodle, my whole career, starting from day one. The first episode of season two of that podcast drops on Wednesday. And it's ironic because we begin 
with a look back at another mega season 15 years ago, and that was the year 2005. Season 2, Episode 1, The Ingredients of a Mega Season, this Wednesday only on Patreon. Uh, and in fact, the, uh, the podcast is going to be more produced, better, you'll see, for those of you that are patrons. And uh, so if you want to become a patron and support this in the off-season, uh, you do so, patreon.com slash hurricane track. The link to that is in the description of this video. So a big thank you to everybody who watched the videos this year, who interacted on social media. Some of you I got to meet in person, and I'm telling you, all of you together makes it so much worthwhile um, than you would ever know. I mean, really, it's just fantastic. So thank you very much. My team thanks you. My family thanks you. It's great to have your support. Uh, and we're going to go forward. We're going to get through the rest of 2020. I know that the pandemic is weighing on a lot of our minds. We've got to get through that and adjust to everything that's happened because of that. But we've done a remarkable job of it, us in the weather community, I think, of sticking with the science and understanding that, and that helped us to get through this season, I think, a little bit better than if we just say, ah, to heck with it, and just bury our heads in the sand and don't care. We do care, and that's why we're here. The common thread being the weather binding us together. You guys have a great rest of your evening. Now it's evening that I'm wrapping this up. Thanks for sticking it out and listening to me uh, all season long. I'll be back tomorrow as we start the day one of the off-season with the Hurricane Outlook and Discussion Off-Season Edition. I'll see you then. I am Mark Sutter for HurricaneTrack.com. Thanks as always. I'll talk to you again tomorrow as we begin the off-season.